Enki, the father of the Anunnaki. Ea Enki, the third of the great Babylonian triad of gods, which consisted of Anu, Enlil and himself. Ea was the god of the waters, and like Anu, is called the father of the gods. As a god of the abyss, he appears to have been a deity of wisdom and occult power, thus allegorically associated with the idea of depth and profundity. He was the father of Merodach, who consulted him on the most important matters connected with the kingship of the gods. Indeed, he was consulted by individuals of all classes, who desired his light to be thrown upon their crafts and businesses. Thus he was the god of artisans in general, blacksmiths, stonecutters, sailors, and artificers of every kind. He was also a patron of prophets and seers. As the abyss is the place where the seeds of everything were supposed to originate, so he appears to have fostered reproduction of every description. Ea was supposed to dwell beside Anu, who inhabited the pole of the ecliptic. The site of his chief temple was at Eridu, which at one time stood before the waters receded upon the shore of the Persian Gulf. We have already seen that Ea Enki, under his Greek name of Oans, was supposed to bring knowledge and culture to the people of Eridu. There are many confusing myths connected with him, and he seems in some measure to enter into the Babylonian myth of the Deluge. Alexander Polyester, Apollodorus, and Eusebus, copying from Barossus, state that he rose from the sea upon his civilizing mission. And Abidenos says that in the time of Daon, the shepherd king of the city of Pantibiblon, meaning the city where the books were gathered together. And Datos appeared again from the Eurythrian Sea, in the same form of those who had shown themselves before, having the shape of a fish blended with that of a man. Then reigned Aderachus of Pantibiblon for the term of 18 Sari. In his days there appeared another person from the Sea of Eurythra, like those before having the same complicated form between fish and man. His name was Odacon. This name is very odd. If I say it like this, Odacon sounds very much like Odin. From the remarks of Apollodorus, but the whole passages are very obscure. The words of wisdom are only open to the ears of understanding. The chief extract from the fragments of Barossus concerning Owens state that, in the first year, there made its appearance from a part of the Eurythrian Sea, which bordered upon Babylonia, an animal endowed with reason who was called Owens. According to the accounts of Apollodorus, the whole body of the animal was like that of a fish, and had under the fish's head another head, and also feet below, similar to that of a man, subjoined to the fish's tail. His speech too was articulate and human, and there was a representation of him to be seen in the time of Barossus. This being, in the daytime, used to converse with men, but took no food at that season. And he gave them insight into letters and science and every kind of art. He taught them to construct houses, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge, geometria. So the first piece of work is attributed to E.R. Enki. The ancient druids state that it was the invention of language that brought the lie into being. Before this, humanity was apparently telepathic, which is described as an electrical storm caused by a passing meteor. So the written word would have caused a problem within the Celtic cultures. 
I will do a big piece on the Druids after finishing in Babylon. E.R. Enki made the people distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect fruits. He instructed them in everything and humanized mankind. So universal were his instructions. Nothing material has been added by way of improvement. Nothing has been added. It has been reformed and reinterpreted. But the origin is always the same, never changes. After this, there appeared other creatures, like Owans, of which Barossus promises to give an account when it comes to the history of the kings. The Writings of Owans Moreover, says Polyester, of their different ways of life and of civil politics, and the following is a purport of what he said. What follows is an almost perfect parallel to Athanentius Kirch's book to Ferdinand III, where he speaks of the divinity, the Cenocephalus, the wicked Ibis, the shape-shifting chimeras, and the two-fold animalistic bodies. There was nothing but darkness and an abyss of water, wherein resided the most hideous things which were produced of a twofold principle. Men appeared with two wings, some with four, and with two faces. They had one body but two heads, one of a man, the other of a woman. They were likewise in their several organs, both male and female. Other human figures were to be seen with the legs and horns of goats. Some had horses' feet, others had the limbs of a horse's behind, but before were fashioned like men, resembling hippo centaurs. Bulls likewise bred with the heads of men, and dogs with fourfold bodies, with the tail of a fish. Also horses with the heads of dogs, men too, and other animals, with the heads and bodies of horses, and the tails of fishes. In short, there were creatures with limbs of every species of animals, and to these, fishes, reptiles, and serpents, with other wonderful animals which assumed each other's shape and countenance, possibly because they all represent the same entity, the nothingness in the abyss. Nothing reigned in the abyss. All of these were preserved in the Temple of Belos at Babylon, the person who was supposed to have presided over them had the name of a Moraka. This is in the Chaldean language, Thalath, which the Greeks express, Tha Lassa, the sea. But according to the most probable theory, it is the equivalent to Selene, the goddess of the moon. All things being in this situation, Pelos came and cut the woman creature asunder, and out of one half he formed the earth, and of the other he formed the heavens. At the same time, he destroyed all the animals of the abyss. All the serpents are gone. The Patrick, I call this move the Saint Patrick. The Tiawath, Thalath, or Moraka, America. The deity's name, Mu Alidtu, and she is described as the deity who assists women during childbirth. A good god. All of this, Barossus said, was an allegorical description of nature. For the whole universe consisting of moisture and animals being continually generated therein. The deity Belos has mentioned cut off his own head upon which the other gods mixed the blood as it gushed out with the earth, and from this men were formed. On this account it is that they are rational and partake of divine knowledge. The word dis in Latin is push, 
Adeptus Pater, the Celtic Pluto, Hades. And in relation to these gods, it would mean push the wealthy. This Pater was commonly shortened to Dis, so don't diss me. And this name has since become an alternative name for the underworld or part of the underworld. This Belus, whom men call Dis, divided the darkness and separated the heavens from the earth and reduced the universe to order. But the animals, so lately created, not being able to bear the prevalence of light, died. Belus upon this, seeing a vast space quite uninhabited, though by nature very fruitful, ordered one of the gods to take off his head, and when it was taken off, they were to mix the blood with the soil of the earth, and from thence to form other men and animals, which should be capable of bearing the light. Belus also formed the stars, the sun and the moon, together with five planets. The element of sacrifice is obviously being reinstalled, because some people follow gods blindly. The month of Tehut, the month of martyrdom, where many lost their heads, many of which were writers, or should I say, reinventors, reformers, reinstallers. This myth, related by E.R. or Owens, regarding the creation of the world, bears a very close relation to that of Merodach and Tiawath, Marduk and Tiamat, which I presented in a previous documentary. It is not often that one finds a fish god acting as a culture hero. Although we find in a Mexican myth a certain deity alluded to as the old fish god of our flesh. Allegorical mythology would have seen in E.R. Enki as a hero arriving from another climate in a wave-tossed vessel who had landed on the shores of the Persian Gulf and had instructed the rude inhabitants thereof in the culture of a higher civilization which is the same for Tahut, the month of martyrdom, and Quetzalcoatl, of the Maya of Central America. I do like saying that. There is very little doubt that E.R. has a close connection in some manner with the Noah legend of the Deluge. For example, a Sumerian text exists, in which it would seem as if the ship of E.R. was described as the timbers of which its various parts were constructed are mentioned. Now if the timber used in the building of the ship aligns with the Oum writing, then it could be symbolic, and the Ark is literature. There's an epiphany right there. I do ponder, 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 ponder. The refugees that it saved consisted of Iyar himself, Daukina, his wife, Merodak, and Inesh, the pilot of Eridu, along with Ninigi Nagiasur. Of course, it would seem natural to the Babylonians to regard the Persian Gulf as the great abyss, whence all things emanated. As Jastro very rightly remarks, in the word of Iyar, of a character more spiritual than that of Enlil. He commands, and whatever he plans comes into existence. A holy, beneficial power, he blesses the fields and heals mankind. His most striking trait is his love for humanity. In the conflicts of the gods and mankind, he is invariably on the side of the latter, but so is the bringer of fire, and that would be Zu. When the gods, at the instance of Enlil, as the god of storms, decided to bring a deluge and sweep away mankind, it is E.R. who reveals the secret to his favorite, not the rest of humanity, just one, just one family, Utnapishtim, that is Noah, who saves himself, his family, and his belongings on a ship that he was instructed to build. His, him, alone. Why do people think he's the god of humanity? Those waters personified by him are not those of the turbulent and treacherous ocean, but those of irrigating streams and of commerce carrying canals. It's all about business. Enki is Lord Business. 
He is thus a very different God from Enlil, the Lord of the Heaven, who possesses many attributes of destruction. Ea, in his benevolent way, thwarts the purpose of the riotous God of Tempest, which greatly enrages Enlil. In an eloquent manner, Ea implores Enlil not to precipitate another deluge, and begs that instead of such wholesale destruction of man, they may be instead punished by sending lions and jackals, or by famines and pestilences. So Enki here is suggesting that using the seven would be a more appropriate course of action. Enlil and Enki appear to be two sides of the same coin. Either way, death and destruction is the element they share the most. Enki brought trade and language, and all the conflict that arose from it pushed the wealthy. Enlil hearkens to the speech of Enki, the god of Hades, heart is touched. <laughs> And the god of the underworld blesses Utnapishtim and his wife. Let that sink in. If this myth is a piece of priest craft, it argues that better relations were gained between the authorities of Eridu and Nippur, meaning the two myths were merged together. Which means the Enlil and Enki myth were originally separate. Iyar had many other names, the chief of which was Ninagal, meaning God of Great Strength. He was also called Enki, which describes him as the Lord of Earth, through which his waters zigzagged. This would be the wave form serpent fish god. In such a country as Babylonia, earth and water are closely associated, as under that soil, water is always to be found at a distance of a few feet. Thus, the interior of the earth is the domain of Iyar, but it is also the dwelling place of Enlil, and they may be one in the same. They are twin selves. Enter the rabbit hole. Urzengel, the alternative name for Gabriel, also means Archangel in German. The meaning is head weapon of the wave form serpent fish god. They may be seven aspects of one, and in relation to Enki, as they are personified weapons of confusion, pestilence, and disease. So far in this series, the figures who are using the seven are the Council of the Gods, which is the great power given to Merodach. Tiamat, the new concept, raised tempests and countless other beings. Enlil, storms and tempests, and also Enki, using Enlil. Same forwards as back. Nergal and his pestilence agents, many of which seem to have the same story written by a different hand. I call this move the Saint Patrick. I have recently learned at P.A. Pa can mean once, twice, thrice, etc. So Pa means thrice, and Trick means trick. I will let you put them together. But it is also the Pa in Zuzu, Pa Zuzu, thrice Zuzu. Like I said, everything is connected. I will do a full summary after my work in Mesopotamia, as I am tracking their positions. And what you haven't seen yet are the seven vampire demons, specifically of the god Ea, that is Lord Enki. Many names, many faces. The Entity. Coming soon. But Enki may actually be Bel, and all of them fall from Abzu. And Borgia 2003 also see Enzi is the Sumerian cuneiform for lord or priest. 
the 1350 BC Armana letters use N for Belu, though not exclusively. The most common spelling is mostly B and Li, to make Beli or Belai, or its equivalent. Some example letters using the cuneiform N are the letters EA for El Armana. Armana is the modern Arabic name for the site of the ancient Egyptian city of Akhetaten, which was the capital of the country under the reign of Akhenaten. The site is officially known as Tel El Amarna, so named after the Benai Amran tribe, who were living in the area when it was discovered. Now in relation to the raven-headed men who first inhabited Babylon, seven kings they had, six thousand they ruled, and their father was named Benani. Amran means gift of God. Beni or Benai is a Latin or Greek name, is blessed, strong, brave bear, victory bringer. All the names starting with Benai means son of or descendant of, often referring to a Berber tribe or clan. Benai Amran can mean son of the gift of God. In relation to Merodach, the gift is the great power, which is possibly possession. I am also going to suggest that Benai is the Benu Phoenix of ancient Egypt, and both of their lineage, including Akhenaten, would be linked to the bird man, because bird is the word. Enlil has Odin's elements, and Enki shares a similar name. Odakon, Odaon, practically the same. In relation to myself, my grandmother's maiden name was Dunn, and my grandfather's was Christie. The Dunn name is Irish and means a reduced anglicized form of Gaelic, O Doin or O Doin. The meaning is descendant of Don. A by name meaning brown haired or chieftain comes from the Irish Dun or Scottish Gaelic Dun and is cognate with Old Irish Den. The name Odin also means Zoo. But from my research, Zu is descended from man, and humanity would be his all-father. In relation to Dingur, the Sumerian word for creator god, Gur is a type of Indian cattle having a distinctive red or brown color. So the meaning here is the same forwards as back, brown cow or cow brown. So Dingur can mean chieftain cow, but wouldn't that be a variant for describing the great bull of heaven? Gur can also mean girl, so it can also mean chieftain girl. It's all about perspective, of which there are many. So my names are Christy and Dunn, but wait, I am thrice great. My third family name is Appleby, from my great grandfather, a Sicilian prize fighter and fireman who changed his name when he came to live in Britain. He was named after the place where he originated, which means my family has very old roots in Sicily. He originated in Apollonia, Sicily. Apollonia is the Greek feminine form of Apollo, Apollo meaning destroyer. Apparently, I am a descendant of Zu, Odin, Apollo and Christ. Obviously, I don't buy into this. We are all one family. We are all equal. It is the locations in relation to my research that really interest me.